welcome to Role Playing History, the podcast where we explore the history of role playing games. I'm Wayne Davis, and I'll be your guide for today's tour. Episode 108 The Best Game Modules, Published Adventures of All Time from You, Part 1. Yeah, I wish I could have come up with a shorter, better title, but uh, you know. So this week, we finally get to the show we've been promoting for months. I've taken a ton of emails, tweets, and Facebook messages from our listeners around the world, and I've pulled up information on as many of the adventures as humanly possible. And let me get a plug in real quick. We've still got next week's show, so if you don't hear your favorite this week, let me know what that is, and if I don't have it lined up for next week, I'll get it in there. And if I need to run a third show to get everything in, you can bet your ass I'm going to do it. Also, during the past couple of shows, I've noted that the majority of this show is old school D&D, and that's true. What's also true is that as of today, the entire list is D&D adventures. Like I said, you guys spoke up and I listened. Since we've got so much old school in here, I need to try to lay out the ground rules I use to get things organized. Those of us who are old school remember that TSR tended to number their adventures in series, such as the X series and the S series. That's not done much under the Wizards of the Coast banner, but that old system left me with a quandary. Do I cover all of the adventures in a series, knowing that we don't have all of the X series, for example, on this show, or do I cover everything we've got in a semi-chronological order? I decided to go with the semi-chronological order, and I apologize if you would prefer I'd done it the other way. With the ground rules out of the way, let's hop on the tour bus and crank it up for today's topic. Now, we can't have a look at the best adventures of all time without starting with the first one. Palace of the Vampire Queen was the first published standalone adventure for any role-playing game. Now, let me cover this before the emails and tweets start. Temple of the Frog, which was released in 1975, was the first published adventure for a tabletop role-playing game. However, it was published in the D&D Blackmore expansion booklet, therefore it was not the first standalone. And we will be covering Temple of the Frog later, because it got an update that made this list. Written by Pete and Judy Karastan, Palace of the Vampire Queen was published by We Warriors in 1976. Now, when it was originally written, it was intended to be an unlicensed D&D product, but TSR saw the wisdom in having a published adventure available for players and made a deal with We Warriors for exclusive distribution. And needless to say, this was the first product from We Warriors to see a wide distribution. One of the things that was noted by listener after listener was the artwork. In the release, the artist was credited as Morno. That's the pseudonym for Brad Schenk, who a large number of us old schoolers will know as one hell of an artist. One more note on the fringes of the adventure before we get into it. TSR didn't publish their own standalone adventure until 1978, and that's because Gary Gygax didn't think anybody would actually want to buy an adventure written by somebody else. His argument was that people would want to create their own. Needless to say, he was ultimately proven wrong. To a point, anyway. All right, so let's get into the supplement. One thing that's very different from what we're used to is that Palace of the Vampire Queen wasn't released in a bound book. It came out as a batch of 8.5 by 11 inch pages, loose, and tucked into a black folder with the copyright notice taped inside the cover. Another odd thing is that from time to time, TSR would find a missing page in the folders as they went to ship. To fix this, they literally Xeroxed the missing pages and put them into the folder. And some of those copies were blatantly obvious copies. For our younger listeners, toss Xerox, that's X-E-R-O-X, into a Google search, and you'll understand why us old folks are laughing our collective asses off. All right, let's get into the background for this adventure. A vampire queen has kidnapped the king's only daughter, and it's the job of the group to go and rescue her. That's pretty much it. And for the record, the entirety of the background was printed on a single page. Yeah, I know, I know, you're asking how this adventure could possibly be worthy of being on this show. Well, besides being the first, it's got a really good reason for being an anomaly at the time. As you might remember from our D&D episode, in the early years, the game wasn't much more than a raid and pillage game, since Gary Gygax believed that was all a group of adventurers was out there to do. So having an actual 
reason for going into the dungeon. It was a unique idea. And as much as Palace of the Vampire Queen has been loved over the years, we do have to note that those who've written adventures since this one learned a lot from the mistakes that were made. You know, let's not call them mistakes. I mean, it was the first, so they did what they knew how to do. Maybe we need to refer to what's come since as an evolution. One thing that's very obvious when you look at it with a 2023 eye is that a lot of it makes zero sense. I mean, let's start with the monsters. I mean, this is the lair of a vampire queen. So you'd expect a few undead running around to guard the place. However, there are bandits running around, balrogs out there to fight, and even a wizard selling magic items. So even though it did have a plot, in execution it played into the pillage, 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 loot, loot, loot theme of the time. The presentation itself has also been noted, and not necessarily in a positive way. Again, it was a different time, and to that point, nobody was quite sure how you'd present a dungeon in a production-style form for release. While there were monsters and treasure placed, there weren't a lot of stats provided for them other than hit points. And the text itself straight up told the DM they'd have to do a lot of work in order to use it. In fact, We Warrior referred to Palace of the Vampire Queen as a Dungeon Master's kit rather than a module or an adventure. Palace of the Vampire Queen got six editions in a short amount of time. The original plus three more in 1976 and two more in 1977. By the 5th edition, TSR had stopped distributing third-party materials, so we Warriors had to distribute it and the 6th edition on their own. We Warriors went under in 1978, but their entire line was picked up by Prices Intermedia in 2019 and almost immediately dropped a remastered version of the game. So if you're interested in the remastered version, check out their website, pigames.net. If you're looking for the original... Unless you've got one hell of a good used game shop, your best move is drive through RPG.com. By 1978, TSR had finally realized that there was a market for published adventures, and they wasted no time getting themselves into the game. One of these first adventures is the first in the B series of modules. B1, In Search of the Unknown, was written by Mike Carr and published in 1978. It was specifically designed for use with the D&D Basic set, though the original release also had a section detailing how it could be used with AD&D. In Search of the Unknown was a 32-page booklet with an outer folder and a two-color cover. David C. Sutherland III and David A. Trampierre handled the art for this initial release, and even those who aren't necessarily fans of the adventure itself say the artwork is top-notch. Over the years, there were six printings of the adventure, and something I do need to note is that Darlene Pakul handled the artwork for the 1981 edition. The adventure was truly set up to be an introductory adventure. Written for groups at the starting level, it was built to take them to level three. The style of writing and presentation were also directed towards new players, as there were a number of hints and suggestions provided for both. Among these are the fact that much of that language explains the workings of the adventure along with the tips and suggestions. There are also 48 pre-generated first-level characters provided, which gave new players the ability to play without having to sweat the concept of character creation. It also lays out henchmen and hirelings in case the group wants or needs them. It also tosses the new DM a bone or two, providing some unkeyed rooms and caves that give the DM a chance to fill them in and create some of their own encounters for the adventure. Finally, while the adventure has been portrayed as setting neutral over the years, in the first printing, there were suggested locations to put the module in, like Rotic, Ten, and The Pale, which would lead a more experienced gamer to think it was supposed to be set in the world of Greyhawk. The subsequent five printings removed these suggestions. There's something else big about this that I want to hit on, but let's get into the adventure itself. The background is that many years ago, Rogan the Fearless and Zeligar the Unknown, who were a couple of very wealthy adventurers, built themselves a nifty little base of operations. Called the Caverns of Quasquetong, it was a hidden complex they used to conduct their business away from the prying eyes of others. They did do some good for the locals, defeating an invasion of barbarians. Eventually, though, they put their own army together to chase them down, and during that, they were killed. The PCs drop into the adventure shortly after this, drawn to the caverns by the various rumors out there. 
Per the rules, each character knows a rumor and they're off to chase down the treasure that those rumors lead to. Over the course of the adventure, they work their way through the upper level, which is completely finished, as well as the lower level, which has a bunch of random monsters in it. One of the big selling points on this is that it's not just a monster killing adventure. There are also a bunch of traps for the group to deal with, and many of them were considered at the time to be rather unique. Again, a phenomenal starting adventure, and for those of us who played and loved the old red box, it made teaching D&D to others much easier. So, I mentioned I have another nugget about the background history of the adventure to share, and it ties back into our D&D and Dave Arneson shows from the very early days of this program. To summarize, Dave Arneson sued TSR for royalties concerning the basic set in 1977. This led to TSR swapping out the books Dungeon Geomorphs and the Monster and Treasure Assortment, which were written by Arneson, with this adventure. Part of the idea behind it was to stave off the lawsuit, since Arneson would no longer have anything in the set itself and wouldn't be eligible for royalties. The other reason was that since Mike Carr would be getting the royalties, TSR figured Arneson might drop the suit, since he and Carr were friends, and the assumption was that Arneson wouldn't want to take money out of his friend's pocket. I managed to find a couple of reviews for this adventure, so let's cue those up. Don Turnbull did his in the June-July 1979 edition of White Dwarf. He gave it a rating of 9 out of 10 and praised the game's, quote, excellent format, for instance, and the comprehensive way in which the scenario is introduced. TSR's high quality has not been in any way compromised, end quote. He had a couple of minor criticisms, but overall, he said he rather enjoyed it. John Sprunk shared his recollections of the game for Blackgate in 2002, quote, I was hooked from the start, controlling this awesome new game that stretched our imaginations. Even though it's been more than 30 years, I still remember the cool tricks and traps, especially the Chamber of Pools, the teleportation rooms, and the young red dragon I placed in one of the dungeon storerooms just for fun." End quote. In Search of the Unknown is available in PDF form on the DM's Guild, and I've seen it reproduced for sale in multiple game shops, so check yours out to see if it's available if you're a hard copy kind of cat. Next up is the first in the four-module series considered to be among the best, if not the best, of all time. Module S1, Tomb of Horrors, was written by Gary Gygax and released by TSR in 1978. Now, Gygax had written it way before the publication date and had used it at Origins in 1975. And in something that is still done today, it was used for official D&D tournament play. It should be noted that Tomb of Horrors was not a Gygax unique idea. He got the idea from Alan Lucian, who was one of the playtesters for the original game, and then developed the adventure from it. Gygax noted his reason for creating the adventure was, quote, There were several very expert players in my campaign, and this was meant as yet another challenge to their skill and the persistence of their theretofore invincible characters. Specifically, I had in mind foiling Rob Kuntz's PC Robolar and Ernie Gygax's PC Tensor, end quote. Needless to say, he also hoped other DMs would use the adventure to challenge their own players. Even though Gygax had the adventure pretty well laid out when he ran it for tournament play, it required a bit of spit and polish before it was published for the masses. That took place during 1977, and as I mentioned, was released a year later. Developed to run with first edition AD&D rules, it was published with a monochrome cover and included a 20-page book, a 12-page book, and an outer cover. It also had a book of illustrations that DMs could share with their players as the adventure rolled along. Tomb of Horrors was republished in 1981 and combined as a 32-page booklet with a full-color cover. It has been considered to be the first high-level scenario as it was marketed for groups level 10 to 14. Over the years, Tomb of Horrors has either been reprinted, revised, or had portions of it included in nearly a dozen different books and still survives in the fifth edition of the game. So let's get into the plot of the adventure. Set in the world of Greyhawk, the idea is for the group to infiltrate the crypt of a wizard, the Demilich Aserach. Filled with deadly traps, the group is challenged with making their way into the Inter Sanctum to destroy him. The adventure is divided into three encounters, each of which are supposed to take 30 minutes to run. The first consists of two false entrances to the tomb itself. The second is the group dealing with the traps to reach the inner sanctum. And the third is the actual scenario inside that inner sanctum. 
In 2004, Dungeon Magazine did a ranking of the greatest D&D adventures of all time, and Tomb of Horrors came in at number three. Don Turnbull did a review of the game for the June-July 1979 White Dwarf magazine. He gave the module a 10 out of 10. He loved the difficulty of the module, noting about the dungeon that, quote, it is sprinkled extensively with subtle, insidious, and carefully laid traps, and it will be a fortunate adventurer who manages to avoid them. End quote. Laura Schorberg had this to say about the module for Wired in March of 2008, quote, This is a D&D adventure created in 1978 for the purposes of testing the wit and fortitude of adventuring parties at game tournaments. Testing is used here in the same sense as the sentence, We'll be testing the dog for rabies. Let's just say the subject is not expected to survive the procedure. End quote. The legacy of Tomb of Horrors is all over the gaming landscape and has even made its way into the film world. I'm talking about you, Ready Player One. In the original novel, the character James Halliday recreates the dungeon in great detail and the other characters have to successfully survive it in order to win his fortune. In the movie adaptation, the graffiti on the back of X Van is from Tomb of Horrors. Tomb of Horrors is not one of those modules that most people are going to want to part with, so your best bet is going to be the DM's Guild. I should probably note at this point that all four modules of the S series made this show, so it makes sense that S2 is the next entry on the list. White Plume Mountain was written by Lawrence Schick and published by TSR in 1979. Schick wrote the adventure as part of his application for a job with TSR. Over the years, Schick reported that he'd taken what he considered to be the best parts of dungeons he'd created in the past and put them together. TSR was so impressed with it, they hired Schick and published it without a single change. He also admitted that he was quite proud to have the adventure published as is, but noted, quote, It's also a little embarrassing, since the adventure was really just a sampler of clever ideas that were never fully fleshed out, end quote. We've got a bit more history to cover, but I think this is a good point to drop in the plot coverage. Set in the world of Greyhawk, White Plume Mountain is, as you might have guessed from what we've said already, a dungeon crawl. The setup for it is the theft of three magical sentient weapons, the Trident Wave, the Warhammer Whelm, and the sword Black Razor. The owners of the three weapons got notes taunting them, stating that the weapons were being held in White Plume Mountain and were signed by the wizard Karaptus. There's a bit of history on old Karaptus. About 1,300 years ago, he made his way down into the mountain, which is a volcano, by the way, with a company of gnomes, and he hasn't been seen since. So the PCs have to follow the same path Karaptus took to get into the lair and retrieve the weapons. White Plume Mountain is 16 pages long, but divided into 27 encounters. Some are battles, some involve traps, and others require feats of strength or dexterity to accomplish. This varied mix is a large part of what has made this adventure so loved by players and DMs over the years. Lawrence Schick has noted over the years that he's been, quote, a little embarrassed by Black Razor inasmuch as it's a blatant ripoff of Elric's Stormbringer. I would not have put it into the scenario if I ever thought it might be published, end quote. Oh, I forgot to mention this a moment ago. This adventure was designed for levels 5 through 10. Versions of White Plume Mountain have been published over the years, as WotC continues to update the adventure for the current version of the game. In fact, the latest version was released in 2017 as a part of the Tales from the Yawning Portal supplement, which is a collection of adventures for use with 5th edition. For those either play or half played Dungeons & Dragons Online, White Plume Mountain showed up in 2018. Most of the original encounters and monster from the original adventures show up, but Wave has been changed to a quarterstaff since the game doesn't have tridents in it. And it's review time. In that D&D Best Adventure issue of Dragon we've been mentioning off and on, White Plume Mountain came in at number 9. Kirby T. Griffiths reviewed it for the March 1981 edition of The Space Gamer. He noted that the background was, quote, interesting, end quote, he also found it well-organized, more believable than most, and closed by saying, quote, This on the whole is a very good module. There are no flaws, end quote. Jim Bambra handled the review for the April 1983 edition of White Dwarf. The overall rating was 8 out of 10, and he pointed out the focus on problem solving, noting that it has, quote, many interesting problems for players to overcome, end quote. 
He compared it to Tomb of Horrors, noting that White Plume Mountain was, quote, quite lenient, end quote. And I should have mentioned this for Tomb of Horrors, but I'll drop it in here. All four modules of the S series were included as part of the Dungeons of Dread hardcover edition, which released on March 19th, 2013. So if you're looking for it, that's not a bad place to try. I also mentioned the Tales from the Yawning Portal release, but if you're looking for the original, you know the drill. Used Gamer Bookstore or the DM's Guild. Next up on our list is one of the legendary modules in the history of D&D. The official designation is Module B2, but we all know it as the Keep on the Borderlands. Designed for groups level 1 through 3, it was written by Gary Gygax and released in December of 1979. Some sources report the release year is 1980, but my thought on that is that early 1980 was probably when some stores first had it available. Potato, potato, as it were. Keep on the Borderlands was a 32-page booklet with an outer folder, cover art by Jim Rosloff, and interior art from Errol Otis. It was specifically designed for use with the D&D Basic set, also known as the Red Box. In fact, it was included in printings of that set from 1979 to 1982. However, even while it was included, it was also available for purchase separately, and that's how I got it back in the day, by the way. And much as we've seen a few times already, the first printing had a note on the inside cover. With minor modifications, it is also suitable for use with advanced Dungeons & Dragons. Needless to say, all of the subsequent printings removed that language. Much like most of the other low-level adventures released for the basic set, the cover of the module noted that it was specifically designed to help beginning players and DMs. Again, there are tips and suggestions throughout, and in a first, rudimentary rules for wilderness adventures. Those weren't included in the basic set, so this might have been the first time a specific group had the chance to go do that. There have been a lot of reprints and updates, but I want to get into the plot before we get to all of those. The Keep on the Borderlands is a series of caverns in the nearby hills from the start point of the adventure. Known as the Caves of Chaos, there are a number of monsters and vicious humanoids that are contained within. As tends to be the case with Gygax written adventures, it's basically a dungeon crawl with some wilderness rules. That being said, it's an excellent dungeon crawl with some wilderness rules. I realize that's not the most detailed plot summary, and it probably doesn't do the adventure justice, but to give too much more might spoil it, so I'm going to stop here. I promised info on the reprints and updates, so let's cover those. It showed up in the 1984 release, 10th Anniversary of Dungeons & Dragons Collector Set, along with a few other adventures written for the box sets. It went out of print in the mid-1980s, but saw a partial reprint in the compilation B1-9 through In Search of Adventure, which dropped in 1985. I call it a partial reprint because the Caves of Chaos were in there, but none of the rest of the locations. As tends to be the case with the best of the adventures that have been released over the years, Wizards of the Coast has updated and released new versions of the module as they've released new versions of the game. Wizards of the Coast has also entered into a partnership with Goodman Games to publish a collector's edition of the original. Those are available in your local game shop, so you might want to consider checking them out. I also need to note that Dungeons & Dragons Online has included Keep on the Borderlands since 2019. And it's review time again. Anders Svensson handled the review for the June-July 1980 edition of Different Worlds magazine. He said, quote, It is well-balanced and suitable for the levels of the characters for which it was written. D&D is a good introductory set of adventure gaming rules, and the Keep on the Borderlands is a good introduction to D&D. End quote. I need to throw a little Jolly Blackburn love in, so let's hit the review from Shaddis Magazine or should we call it Shadis Magazine, in 1996. I've heard it pronounced both ways, that's why I'm doing it. It was a retrospective, and the staff said, quote, Keep on the Borderlands was designed with beginners in mind, and may seem quaint to experienced role players. But that quaintness grows on you as you read through it, and the mix and match quality of the dungeon leaves an impression that's hard to ignore. For a basic D&D trip, there's very little that can match it, end quote. An adventure that I got way more requests for than I figured I might is Rahasia. Officially designated as Module B7, it was written by Tracy and Laura Hickman and released in 1980. 
Jeff Eastley and Timothy Truman handled the artwork for it, for those keeping track at home. Also, for those keeping track at home, the 1980 release came from Daystar West Media. TSR picked it up and released it in 1983 and 1984. I'll tell you what, let's get a bit deeper into this history, and trust me, it's worth it. Laura Hickman was originally credited as the sole author of Rahasia, and it was printed as a 32-page booklet. The reason why Daystar West Media got the release is because it was Tracy Hickman's private publishing company. For the record, no more than 200 copies were ever printed of this particular version, and it was the first of what they called the Night Ventures line of scenarios. Now, how TSR got involved is a full-length story of its own. The Hickmans decided they wanted to publish Rahasia and Pharaoh, which they designed together, and they wanted to do it privately. These releases helped them pick up a reputation on a local level. However, Tracy went into business with an associate, and that deal went bad. I mean, like 30 grand in bad checks bad. So after filing bankruptcy, Tracy made the call to sell the modules to TSR so that, in his words, quote, literally so that I could buy shoes for my children, end quote. TSR liked the modules so much, they hired Tracy Hickman as a game designer. Of that, Tracy has said, quote, they said it would be easier to publish my adventures if I was a part of the company, end quote. The Hickmans rewrote it, and TSR released it in 1983 as a 16-page booklet with an outer folder. The original designation for Rahasia was RPGA1, and it was sold as a limited edition to members of the Role Players Guild of America, which is where the RPGA in the designation comes from. The following year, TSR took Rahasia and module RPGA2, Black Opal Eye, revised and compiled them and published the module as B7 Rahasia. This release was a 32-page booklet with an outer folder with the artwork from Easley and Truman. Now, like I said, it's a very interesting history, but let's cover the plot. An elven village is threatened by a dark priest known as the Rahib. He's kidnapped two of the village's fairest maidens and has demanded that Rahasia, the most beautiful elf, surrender herself in order to free the others. The PCs jump in when they receive a plea for help from Rahasia and are tasked with entering an old temple built on the ruins of a wizard's tower buried under a mountain in order to save all of the kidnapped women. Rahasia was released for the D&D Basic set and was for characters level 1 through 3. I've got one review. Wayne Ligon covered it for the March-April 1985 issue of The Space Gamer. He stated, quote, A nice story combined with an interesting temple complex makes this module a good one. The villains are well portrayed and have definite objectives, end quote. He also noted the module was good because the emphasis is not on killing, instead forcing the characters to think their way through the issues. We're going to head back into the S series for the next entry. Module S3, Expedition to the Barrier Peaks, was written by Gary Gygax and released in 1980. It was keyed to the AD&D 1st Edition rules and built for characters level 8 to 12. Expedition to the Barrier Peaks brought a bit of science fiction into the AD&D game world, and that comes from the James M. Ward game Metamorphosis Alpha. Let me back up a bit and explain that. In 1976, TSR was looking to get into the science fiction role-playing game game. Ward had shown TSR the notes for Metamorphosis Alpha, and Gygax thought that the best way to get sci-fi into gaming would be through a tournament scenario. So at the 1976 Origins convention, Gygax took the Greyhawk Castle campaign and added a spaceship to it. Rob Kuntz then suggested Gygax put monsters in the spaceship. Kuntz also gets some credit for his machine level, which was added to Greyhawk Castle for the game. Metamorphosis Alpha eventually became the game Gamma World, which we've covered in a previous episode. And when that happened, Gygax made the call to bring Expedition to the Barrier Peaks to the masses. He quickly updated the adventure to the AD&D rules, then published it in 1980. At release, the adventure was a 36-page book and a 32-page book, and also had two outer folders. It happens to be one of the first deluxe scenario modules, and also had a book of illustrations to be shown to the players during the course of the game, and that had four color paintings in it. Now, to this point in the show, I've been noting that the various adventures have been updated as new versions of D&D have come out. That has not been the case for Expedition to the Barrier Peaks, at least 
not from Wizards of the Coast. Goodman Games released Original Adventures Reincarnated Number 3, Expedition to the Barrier Peaks, in December of 2019. It has reprints of the 1980 and 1981 editions and has also been updated to the 5th edition of D&D. So if you're looking for a physical copy, check out your local game shop. So what's the adventure all about? It takes place on a spaceship in the Barrier Peaks mountain range of the World of Greyhawk campaign setting, and the background looks a bit like this. The Grand Duchy of Jaff is constantly under attack from monsters that keep coming out of a cave in the mountain. Lots of attacks, lots of monsters. So the Grand Duke of Jaff hires the group to figure out where the monsters are coming from and to stop the raids. What they ultimately discover is that the cave is actually the entrance to a spacecraft. The inhabitants got some sort of virus and died, but a large number of the ship's robots are still up and running. And while the group could fight them, they don't have to. Oh, and you know those dumbass plot coupons or coins or whatever the hell they're called in video games these days? You can thank this adventure for basically starting them, as the group is required to collect colored access cards in order to advance to the next story arc. Thanks, Gary. And while I did just vent a little frustration towards the game, it, it really is an interesting adventure to not only run, but to play. The included booklets do a fantastic job of getting into detail about the ship and the various compartments therein, as well as a good detail about the mountain, the monsters, and the robots. So. All in all, it is well done on the part of Gary Gygax. But that's just my opinion. What did the reviewers have to say? Tim Bird reviewed it for the August 1980 edition of The Space Gamer. His review was favorable, and he noted that it, quote, successfully combines fantasy with science fiction and is extremely fun to play. It's one of the best modules TSR has published, end quote. Marcus L. Rowland covered it in the August 1981 edition of White Dwarf, noting he found the module, quote, very enjoyable, with ideas and creatures eminently suitable for wider use, end quote. He gave it a 9 out of 10 and noted he'd have given it a 10, but for the fact that some of the maps were printed on both sides of the same sheet, therefore making them useless as a DM shield or screen. Oh, and we've got a celebrity endorsement for this one. Stephen Colbert, the host of The Late Show, has mentioned on more than one occasion that Expedition to the Barrier Peaks is his personal favorite. Next up, we get to the first of our entries in the X series of modules. I should probably get into details about what the letters mean for the modules, but I think we'll either cover that as an episode of its own or at the end of our list. Hit me up and let me know what you think. I think if we're going to start in the X series, we should probably start with the module numbered X1. The Isle of Dread was written by David Cook and Tom Moldvay for use with the D&D Expert set and was released in 1981. It was designed for groups levels 3 through 7. The Isle of Dread was the very first published adventure for any version of D&D that placed its focus on wilderness exploration. It is, in fact, a major theme. And wilderness exploration would continue to be at least a minor theme for all of the modules in the X series, and we'll be noting that as we go along, because I can assure you this isn't the only module in the X series on our list. The Isle of Dread also brought the debut of the Kopru, Aranya, Rakasta, and the Phantom, along with several types of dinosaurs. These creatures would become better fleshed out in later books, including many D&D products specifically set in Mystara. The Isle of Dread itself has gone on to have a long life, as some of its locations, such as Darakin, Karmekos, Yarum, and Thyatis, and I know I screwed those pronunciations up, sorry. Anyway, they've been utilized in other adventures over the years, and the Isle continues to be a part of the D&D universe, though its exact location has changed from version to version of the system over time. Cook and Moldvay have stated over the years that their inspiration for the Isle of Dread was King Kong, and that inspiration can be noticed throughout the setting. When we get into the actual printings of the module, it needs to be noted that there were two versions printed, and they're very different looking, so which printing you have should be apparent. The first edition was printed in 1981, as I mentioned a moment ago, and consisted of 32 pages in an Alder folder with cover artwork from Jeff D. Actually, both versions have those characteristics. Where the differences come in is that the 1981 version was included in every copy of the D&D Expert set as an example of outdoor wilderness settings and adventures. 
This particular version is laid out like all of the early D&D adventures were. There was no D&D logo on it. There was a diagonal strip in the top left corner that laid out what edition of the game it was printed for, and the back cover had an illustration and a list of all the available D&D products at the time. As one would expect, it was also available for purchase on its own and frequently could be found already three-hole punched. The second printing first popped up in 1983, and it came out with the revised version of the expert set. Cover art was handled by Timothy Truman, and the cover had a red-orange border. The layout for this printing was more typical of the mid-1980s products. The logo was prominently displayed on the cover, the diagonal strip was changed to a horizontal one across the top, and there was no back illustration or product list. Instead, it provided a text description of the adventure itself. There are a few more minor changes between the two, but the visuals are really what set those two versions apart. As I mentioned, the Isle of Dread has seen at least portions of itself survive and pop up in other D&D products over the years, but something I wanted to specifically note is that Goodman Games published Original Adventures Reincarnated Number 2, The Isle of Dread, in December of 2018, and it has both versions of the adventure, an interview with Zeb Cook, and a conversion of the adventure to 5th edition. And as I've mentioned, the Goodman Games versions are licensed from Wizards of the Coast. And finally, the Isle of Dread got the D&D Online treatment in 2022. All right, so we've covered history. Let's get to the plot. The overall idea of Isle of Dread was to get players away from the standard dungeon crawl and into something different, like wilderness adventures. The hook for the adventure is the group finding a fragment from a ship's log that mentions a mysterious island where a lot of treasure can be found. So as adventurers are wont to do, they head off in search of it. And the adventure is essentially a series of encounters across the island as the group searches for the promised treasures, taking on a variety of strange and exotic creatures as they do so. Anders Svensson reviewed the Isle of Dread in the July 1981 edition of Different Worlds magazine, and he noted that, quote, Isle of Dread is overall a very excellent product. For my needs, it's probably the best of the modules TSR have produced. Many GMs will find it a worthwhile purchase, end quote. After the designer Tom Maldvey passed away in 2007, Steve Winter eulogized him on the Wizards of the Coast website and noted that Isle of Dread was, quote, Tom's work that had the widest impact, end quote, noting that including the adventure in the expert set, quote, made it one of the most widely known and played adventures for years, end quote. Dungeon Magazine ranked the Isle of Dread at number 16 on their list of the greatest D&D adventures of all time. I noted the Goodman Games release a moment ago, and that should be available at your local game shop. If you just want one version and don't mind PDFs, it's available at the DMs Guild. Tell you what, why don't we just hit the next module in the X series? Module X2, Castle Amber, was written by Tom Moldvay and published in 1981. But while Moldvay gets the writer credit, Dave Cook, Alan Hammock, Kevin Hendricks, Harold Johnson, and John Pickens helped in the development. Art for the release came from Jim Holloway, Harry Quinn, Jim Roslov, Stephen D. Sullivan, and Errol Otis. Moldvay noted that Castle Amber had a number of literary inspirations. In the actual credits for the release, Clark Ashton Smith and Cassiana Literary Enterprises, Inc. get special thanks. And the quote with the thanks reads, quote, for use of the Avron stories as inspirational material, end quote. In the actual credits for the release, Clark Ashton Smith and Cassiana Literary Enterprises, Inc. get special thanks, and the quote with the thanks reads, quote, for use of the Avron stories as inspirational material, end quote. And if I messed that pronunciation up, I apologize. Castle Amber is actually drawn from the Chateau de Amberville, which is the base of many of the Evrangne books. One of the encounters used in the module pays homage to Edgar Allan Poe's Fall of the House of Usher, while another tips its hat to Hopfrog, also from Poe. Fans of Castle Amber have noted over the years that many of the monsters utilized in the adventure have quite the Lovecraftian feel to them, and Moldvay has never corrected it one way or the other. Finally, the Chronicles of Amber series of books from Roger Zelazny was also an inspiration, as several of the characters and setting pieces mirror characters and pieces in those books. Castle Amber got a sequel of sorts in 1995, 
Mark of Amber was the title, and it came as a boxed set that included a CD, map posters, and player handouts. In Mark of Amber, the castle was renamed to Chateau Cellier. All right, I've been messing up my French enough. Let's just get into the plot. As the PCs are traveling to Glantry, they stop for a night's rest. However, they find themselves drawn into a huge castle that's surrounded by an impenetrable mist. Oh, and that mist is deadly, as if things weren't already hinky enough. If they want to escape, they have to explore the castle, deal with everything they encounter within, and find their way to the interdimensional tomb of Stephen Amber, who cursed the castle in the first place. They'll have to deal with that in order to break the curse and escape. And they're going to have to do it without the use of magic. Or at least by using magic on the down low, since it's frowned upon in this world and could lead the spellcaster to be reported to the Inquisition. Castle Amber was created for use with the D&D Expert set, which was the blue box, and was set for characters of levels 3 through 6. We've got a review, and it's from Jim Bambra in the November 1982 issue of White Dwarf. He rated it 6 out of 10 and said that it was, quote, an attempt to bring randomness back into D&D, end quote. He felt the adventure was a bit erratic and frantic and didn't recommend it for purchase. He noted that, quote, it depends a lot on chance, leaving little room for skill, and at times can be deadly, end quote. That being said, in that 2004 Dungeon Magazine list of the greatest D&D adventures of all time, Castle Amber was ranked 15th. It's been out of print for quite some time, but as always, you can check your used game or bookshop or grab yourself a PDF at the DM's Guild. All right, so at this point, we're almost 18 pages and well over 7,000 words in, and we're not even a third of the way through our list. So I think this is a good spot to bring today's tour to an end. Next week, we'll pick up with the next module in chronological order, which is the sinister secret of Salt Marsh. Oh, and we'll also be covering Against the Giants, among others. I want to note one more time that you can still get your favorite modules in for our list, and they don't have to be D&D modules. I promise you we'll get them onto the show, and I'm more than ready to do more than two shows on this subject if need be, because we really don't get into modules that much on the show, and I do find them exceptionally interesting to research. All the ways to hit me up are coming up in a moment, so if you're interested, please do so. In the meanwhile, please check out our other fine podcast, Bad GM's Campaign Build-Along. This week, our group finally catches a break in their search for the individuals responsible for their recent headaches. But even then, things don't go quite the way they expected. Bad GM's Campaign Build-Along is available wherever you get your podcasts or on our website, badgmproductions.net. The music we use for this show comes from pixabay.com. Check them out for all your royalty-free, license-free music needs. Role Playing History is a production of Bad GM Productions. Check us out on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash gaming forward slash Bad GM Prod, on Twitter at Bad GMP, YouTube and Tumblr, Bad GM Productions. You can email us badgmproductions at gmail.com, and online the website is badgmproductions.net. Next week, we keep our list of the greatest modules and adventures of all time rolling along. Are we going to get to yours? You're going to have to wait and see. But that's next week. Until then, I'm Wayne Davis, and you're role-playing history.